All right, all right. Absolutely. Here we go. That's right, everybody. Look at everybody chiming in. All right. They heard we're going to give away some money. I think. <laughs> all right. Here we go. Facebook Live. Help a teacher. Facebook Live every Monday night at 7 p.m. And look, and we, we start a little late. I don't know. We should probably say every Monday night at 7.05 or 7.10 because I, don't, I can't remember if we've ever started actually right on time at 7 o'clock. Here we go, man. Hey, before we get started, um, you know what's in town? I live in Houston, and we have that whole – those uh, those bunch of characters over at get your teach on oh my gosh that is you talk about a spectacle that i mean just that look i think they got about 1500 teachers over there and it is it is just the cupcakes alone that part alone is a mind blower all right man so here we go we have uh trevor muir on tonight and uh, I talked to this guy for maybe 25 minutes total in my life, and I absolutely love him. And I can't wait to get into it. Before we get into this thing, let me uh, make some announcements. And the first one is uh, we uh, tonight we are going to uh, we have a you know what man the Craig Newmark the Craig Newmark philanthropies are amazing. And tonight again we are going to give away three gift cards. You have your choice. You have a hundred dollar gift card from Amazon or a hundred bucks from target and that's it's your stuff take that hundred bucks spend it on as much stuff for your classroom as you could possibly buy and uh man i'm really really thankful to uh, craig newmark philanthropies for loving teachers and supporting teachers and they are absolutely amazing i am a huge fan Hey, you know what? Somebody wanted to know um, that message just a second ago, and I had that gig. I was talking about it the last few weeks in Corpus Christi, and it was amazing. That whole Teaching a Rockstar thing in Corpus, we had so many amazing teachers. We had the room full, and uh, it was an awesome, awesome event. I loved meeting every one of them. I know a bunch of them are going to be on tonight, and uh, I can't thank them enough. You know what? Coming up, um, this is the time of the year when uh, superintendents and associate superintendents and the assistant to the associate of the superintendent they uh, start realizing they don't have anything planned for august and they start freaking out and that's when they call so if your school or district is looking for some amazing back to school professional development that whole teaching a rock star thing is an amazing way to uh, kick off the school year now um before we uh get this thing started i'm trying to think um you know who else we have uh we have some guests lined up we have great people coming up and um next week i want to give you a heads up because this one this was kind of a hard thing to book man next week we have rich redman and rich is he's an interesting cat i've known this guy for maybe 30 years he is he's a star in nashville he's part of that whole nashville royalty thing he's been on the road with jason aldean for i don't know how many decades and he is an amazing musician actor speaker and a phenomenal educator too and we're going to talk about uh, his work that he takes around the nation when he's not playing and front of stadiums full of people country music he's in classrooms and working with kids and other educators so we'll, we're going to talk about that all right now today tonight my new bestie for the resty is uh trevor muir and uh i can't wait to get into this you know trevor is a teacher he's an author um speaks internationally and his book coming up i want to say oh i, I should have wrote this down I, and he'll he'll know the dates but tonight is registration starts opens tonight for his book study the epic classroom i mean that's the one everybody knows about and talks about and his new book is the collaborative classroom I want to say I might get this wrong. I probably shouldn't say, but I think it starts on March 3rd might be the first uh, Tuesday. I have to check my Tuesdays for his book study. And uh, that happens over on the Twitter. And Trev uh, Trevor is a professor at Grand Valley State University, formal fac former faculty member. You can tell how tired I am of the um, the Buck Institute of Education. And he's one of the Andrew Gomez Dream Foundation speakers. He's been in the Huffington Post, Atlantic, Ed Week. We are teachers. Man, that's an awesome site. And uh, he's given a TED Talk in San Antonio, a TEDx talk. And it was called School Should Take Place in the Real World. God, I love that. And um, all right, man, let's get it. this guy. Listen, everybody has seen his videos, 25 million views of his videos. Let's bring him in. Trevor, my brother from another mother. 
How are you tonight, man? What's up, my brother? For, I see, I, I was <laughs> sister from another Mister is the only other one I know. I, I wasn't planned for that. Hello, my other brother. Yeah, I'll take it though, man. Whatever. Okay. Hey, man, let, let's kick it off. I'm going to talk to you real quick about um, some of your uh, videos and that whole poetry component to your yeah. work and your teaching. How'd you get in all that? Yeah, you know, so I, I'm an English teacher by trade. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite units I found pretty early on as I taught high school English was poetry. And, and for some reason, like it gets kids into like a whole different space than they were when they're just in class. You know what I mean? Like you start spitting poetry and getting them to be honest with each other and, and, and really talking about how they feel and putting images behind it and rhythm. And you just all of a sudden watch kids come alive with it. And, and I found the more that I was vulnerable and did it to them first, like I, I would write a poem and speak it out to them. I, I would watch them get really engaged. So I was like, you know what? I wonder if we could like start a TED talk with a poem, what that would do. And I wonder if I made a video for teachers, if that would get them to perk their ears the same way my kids did. Yeah. Um, and it's just, I don't know. It's just a lot of fun to do. All right, man. I got a quick um, slam poetry story. You ready? All right, let's rock it. All right, so check this out. So my daughter was a writer starting in early, early ages. And she's, I mean, she probably has, I'm not kidding, probably a hundred journals. Okay. And um, and maybe she was 10, I don't know, let me go, 12, probably 11 or 12. And she went to a writing camp and she came home and I said, How, how's it going? Who's your teacher? And she says, my teacher is outspoken bean. And I said, what is that? And she goes, that's my teacher. He's a poet. And I said, okay, here we go. And so, you know, I go like, you know, the last, week of the writing camp the last day you show up and you get to hear the work that your kids wrote yeah and he's telling me man your kid's really talented and i so i go well who are you and he says my, my name is outspoken bean I was okay like, well of course it is and i said i heard you're a poet and he goes yeah man and i said well like what's your real job and he goes that's the job and i said no like <laughs> like what do you do for a living he goes i'm a poet <laughs> and so i said do some poetry and he said sit down and so I sat right in front of him and Man, you called him out. Yeah. He launched into this, this poem. It was un, like, I'm crying yeah. at the end of it. It was amazing. And then, so my kid got into that whole world and she, so she competed for years, went to brave new voices oh, I love Philly, that. in Atlanta. She's, you know, um, just competed around the nation and she even got to do a poem for the uh, national book. What's like the thing at the library of Congress, the national sure. book festival. Uh huh. And so that that part of our lives, you know, that whole slam poetry part was amazing. Oh, I love that. I mean, I'm telling you, you get students who are like completely silent, silent the rest of the time. I've had just countless kids who like hardly say a word. And then all of a sudden you're like, hey, write a poem and, and you can write it however you want. You know, got to put it like in a certain format. It doesn't have to rhyme. I just want you to like tell me what you think. And then we're going to read it out loud. Like you see these kids just wake up all of a sudden. And, and there's something powerful about it. I'm sure your daughter knows, like there's something about rhythm and, and the emotion behind it and using images and all that stuff that gets kids really fired up. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, and that's why I do it in videos and when I give talks, it's just a fun way to kind of get people's attention before we get into more serious matters. Yeah. How did you get into the whole teaching thing from the get go? Were you, were you one of those that want to be a teacher forever? No, absolutely. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I talked to so many teachers all the time and a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them were really good students in school. And, and so naturally they were like, you know what, here's somewhere I've excelled. Here's somewhere I've had teachers who really spoke to me and worked with me well, then I'm going to go into this career and do it well myself as a teacher. I'm literally the opposite of that. I mean, I graduated high school with like a low C minus GPA. That's like my boy. I, it's a long story, but I like squeaked my way into college and I wanted to go into school to be like the next crocodile hunter. I wanted to be the next Steve Irwin. Yeah. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to get a communications degree so I can like somehow have a TV show or something like that. Um, and I had no ambition of being a teacher. That was the last thing on my mind. Um, and then my senior year of college to make a little extra money, uh, a, a mom in Tallahassee, Florida, I went to Florida State, a mom asked me if I would be willing to like mentor or tutor her daughter in writing class, her high school daughter. I was like, sure, I'd, I'd love to make an extra 50 bucks. And so I did that and I watched this girl each week, we'd work together on her writing and she had so little confidence when we first started off. But every time we met, all of a sudden her writing was a little bit better. And every time she started feeling that she was a little bit more confident and capable. And by the end of that year, this girl who failed English the year before got an A in it. And it like blew my mind. 
this this guy that had no ambition in any way at all right now career wise was all of a sudden seeing like wow you can take a student from here to there and you can get them excited in things that they weren't excited about and you can help them like get confident in in their content and writing but then also in the rest of life i want more of this um and and it's from there, that's man, like, isn't it? yes absolutely it, it's addictive watching kids go from a to b it's addictive to help teachers who like feel that you know what the, I'm at the end of my rope. I don't like doing this job anymore. Like I'm not making an impact. It's it's a it's it's addictive to watch them all of a sudden get confidence as well. And um, that's why I just love being a teacher more than anything. Is, yeah. is helping people start believing that they're capable and that they're they're worthy. It's powerful, man. And you know, I probably say it, I, I guarantee because I know I get comments about it, but I say it every week. And I think if there's one thing that we could do a better job of in terms of school leadership, campus leadership, is providing teachers with the evidence that it works providing right. teachers with the evidence that it's making yeah. a difference and i'm not talking about test scores like we kill it we're awesome at providing data we like we are the best in the world at at, at you know assimilating and gathering and synthesizing yeah. data of test scores and an achievement like i know we're amazing at that but no one signed up for that like you did not say right there man so i thought someday when i grow up i really want to improve test scores yeah. like you want to make a difference in a kid's life and that's happening the problem is we're not providing teachers with concrete evidence of look man this is yeah. happening that what that kid right there this is how that kid's life is changing today because of you that's right and and i think that's something that we need to like put more effort into is how do we make how do we gather these stories how do we gather data that's not just some standardized test that a big private corporation put together but yeah. you know how do we how do we gather data that's like look at these kids are changing you're having an impact you know i i just ran into a former student at the airport the other day um, I was flying out somewhere and I met this girl and, and her name is Sarah. And I mean, I'm telling you, she came from a single parent home. Her mom disappeared. She had a dad who worked third shift. She took care of her three little sisters. Um, I mean, just a rough, difficult life. And I remember when she was a freshman in my class, just this girl would come in so tired because she was raising her sisters and going to school and, and working a second shift as a 14 year old girl. And, and I remember just putting everything I had into this girl and not knowing what, what was going to happen with it. Right. Like it was kind of like planting a seed, but not really knowing what it's going to grow into. She left my class at the end of the year and you just don't know. Um, and then I ran into her at the airport. She comes running up to me like Mr. Muir. It was like seven years later. Yeah. And, and and this girl's working as a preschool teacher now like she's she's a school teacher yeah doing it oh i mean and and the funny thing is is like and it blew my mind this was last monday um and and this is like the story of so many teachers and i and i and if i didn't run into sarah at the airport i would have never known that i had a little bit of an impact on her right, right? like i would have never known that this girl went on to want to become an educator and 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 put herself through community college and and was doing all this i wouldn't have known and i just wonder how many teachers quit this job because they don't find out that they are actually making an impact are you with me you know what i mean yeah i'm there yeah. listen and you know at some point in my career you know like i had to get to that place i just had to convince myself I know it's working. Like I know it is. And you know what? Here's here's how I would here's how I would think about it is for whatever reason the kids that I was convinced and I was never able to fix this in my life. You know, in my 25 years in the classroom, I could not for some reason I couldn't change this. Uh, there there'd be a kid I'm thinking to myself on the last day the kids walking out, I'm hugging them goodbye and I'm thinking, "Well, I tried." I mean, yeah, nothing, that's right. Nothing happened there. Yeah. But you, but that that's the first kid to come back and say, oh, my gosh, it was amazing. I'll never forget the day yeah. that you talked about. And they go into all this detail. I'm like, what are you talking? Man, you weren't even paying attention. He's like, no, I was. I swear. So I think if I'm getting through to, to that kid, then the rest of them had to be oh, getting I love something that point. as well. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, I made a video. Um, it was one of the first videos I ever made. It was probably three years ago or so. And I told this whole true story of how this one teacher like really dug in deep with me when I was in sixth grade and my parents were getting divorced and my whole world was coming apart. And I just had this teacher, Mr. Peters, who just spent every day listening to me. I mean, and he would just sit back and listen. And, and, and that's all he did. 
And, and he had this dramatic impact on how my entire life unfolded. I'm a better dad because of Mr. Peters. I'm a better teacher because of Mr. Peters. I'm a better man because of this guy. And, and, and I've told the story and it's a part of like a keynote that I give all over the place. And it's on this video that's gotten thousands of views, all this stuff. And yet I still can't find this guy. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Peters, I have no idea how to get in touch with him. And yet all these people know his story. And it just really drives in the point as, as educators, we don't always know yeah. the impact that we're having. It's like I said, it's kind of like planting a seed and just, we don't know what it's going to grow into. Right. We just have to trust that we're doing the work, that, that we're changing lives. Yeah, I love that, man. You know, there's, there's a part of my uh, presentation at the end. It's moving and it kind of comes full circle to what we were talking about the whole day. There's mm -hmm. this aha moment. And that's the big question whatever happened to Charlie is at the, and like, you know, I say this, listen, I don't know where that guy is. I don't know what he does. I don't know anything, but I know who he is. He's a teacher. That's who he is. That's right. Like he loves people relentlessly. He gives people an opportunity to be great. They're going to mess it up. He knows that he doesn't care. And he comes back and he keeps doing it day after day after day. Like that's a teacher. And I so want that to be a more a part because I'm still, man, I'm still selfish. Like a little bit. Yeah, I still want these. I want the high five and oh my God, you changed my life. Yeah, I want yeah. all that. And you get that sometimes. Sometimes yeah. you get that, that email or that Facebook message or whatever it is. Yeah. But if there's something I think I could improve on it is that is just trusting and giving it to the universe and That's just right. knowing that it's happening and not and not you know expecting to see the results. Well, and so like, that's why a lot of the work that I do, aside from really just trying to help encourage teachers in the work that they're doing, is really kind of asking the question, how can I make the learning experience memorable for students? Yeah. You know, like so much of my school experience, while I did have obviously these shining star teachers throughout, so much of my schooling experience was completely forgettable, right? Like it was sit in rows, listen to information, write it down, regurgitate it on a test, discard that information, and then do it all over again. And, and I can't tell you anything about mitosis at this point. I can't, I can't, I, I, I remember the Pythagorean theorem, but that's about the end of yeah. what I remember about geometry. And like so much of that was forgotten. And now as an educator, I'm like, wait a minute, that was actually important information, right? Like that was stuff that I would love to know now. And yet it's just gone. It's in the ether. And so like, I'm, I'm always trying to figure out how can I teach in a way that's actually memorable for students. Um, and that's why my first book, The Epic Classroom, is really about how do we format, structure our time with kids to be an unfolding story? You know what I mean? Like real, with real conflicts that students have to solve, with real problems that matter. And in order to solve these problems, they have to learn certain content and skills in order to solve them. You know, like, so, hey, we have to create documentaries for World War II veterans um, to, to preserve their stories. Otherwise these veterans are going to die and their stories are going to die with them. What do we need to do? What do we need to learn in order to actually solve this problem? Um, and, and it's just like, and that's why I, I think when we do this and we really walk students through a story, uh, they remember it. You know, it's the same reason if, if I asked you right now, actually, I'll ask you, tell me something that you remember when you were a student, when you were a kid, tell me a, a specific story from school. Like what, what's something that sticks in your mind well, I mean, how long ago was high school? 10 years, 20, 15 years? Dude, high school was a long time, brother. <laughs> a few decades. Yeah, I know. I'm just, I'm just trying to yeah, butter you up a little bit. I appreciate that. You know, when I go back, um, I skip, for whatever reason, I skip all the way through high school. I mean, you know, maybe like... Right? maybe a band trip you know i don't okay. know you know maybe but i don't remember any like academic information i'm probably the word like i wasn't the academic guy i was yeah. just trying to get me a passing grade and let's move on with my life yeah but neither are 20 percent of kids in our country that's why 20 yeah. percent of kids don't graduate high school on time so does that mean like they just like we just forget you know what i mean like because i wasn't an academic guy either it's like well what a waste yeah, man. And you know, here's, here's what I believe. And if, and, you know, I think I'm the only one talking about this and Bill Gates. And by the way, the two of us have nothing in common, but I think I, if, if you call a giant um, suburban school district and you ask them how many kids there are in K and you ask them how many graduating seniors they have uh, this year, it's closer to 50%. Like it's shocking about like where, like where are these kids going? And so anytime you're talking about the top 10% of graduates, you're really talking about, you know, the top 5% because we've yeah. lost the other, we've lost half the kids. Yeah. It just and, doesn't work for most people really. 
Yeah, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that. I don't think we can boil it down to a single thing. I mean, if you ask a politician, they're going to say it's just not good enough teaching, right? right? Like, all the teachers aren't good enough. But it's like, I think what it really is, is that you've got kids who have all of these things going on in life, and all of these things take precedence to school. And so therefore they don't engage in school because they've got to raise their own sisters and brothers. They've got to deal with the abuse at home. They've got to deal with hunger. They've got to deal with all the distractions and cell phones and video games and all these things. I don't want to put my engagement in school. And so like, to me, it's like, all right, well then how do we create a school experience that does engage you? Sure. Not necessarily fun all the time. I mean, I'm a big fan of fun and I try to make learning fun, but not necessarily fun, but how do I make it engaging? How do I, how do I make you actually want to be there and learn? Um, and I think that's what the best teachers do is they, they figure out how do I present this content, this curriculum in a way that makes people actually want to be there and learn it. You know what it is for me? It, it's, it's, it's a couple of things because, you know, I love to dig into that single question. The most of all, that's probably my favorite question is as a result of your classroom. What's the ultimate lesson? Because just like me and you, we're going to forget all this stuff. And yeah. by the way, most of the stuff we're learning, especially in our technological fields, it's, it's not even going to exist in 20 right. years. Mm -hmm. So really, what's that one lesson that you want to use the content of your classroom as the vehicle to deliver? So these kids 30 and 40 years from now, just like me right here, 30 years later, yeah. you know, like what do you want that kid to think immediately? This is what I learned in that class. And this is who I am today. And this is who I became because of that lesson in that class. That's right. I mean, like I, I always I, I do a, a workshop on project based learning and I always started off by asking teachers what makes the ideal graduate. So like when a student graduates high school, whether you're a pre, uh, preschool teacher, third grade or a senior year teacher, when your student eventually gets to the end of their K-12 experience, what does the ideal graduate look like? And always they create this big list of the exact same things. I want them to know how to collaborate. I want them to know how to communicate. I want them to know how to solve problems. I want them to be empathetic and take care of other people. I want them to be good citizens. It's never, I want them to be biology experts. I want right. them to be, uh, you know, strong English majors and Shakespearean experts or Elizabeth, whatever it is. That's never what I hear. It's all those other things first. Um, and yet we still want our students to be knowledgeable. We still want them to be smart, but it's all those other things first. And these other things that I said, these are what we call soft skills, right? Right. Like these are the soft skills. And yet if you Google soft skills right now, you'll see article after article that says that the number one reason people are getting fired in America right now is because they don't possess soft skills, which really raises the question, is there anything soft about getting fired, right? Maybe these are essential skills. Maybe these are the things that actually matter most. And so like when you ask like, well, what matters most? What do I want my students to leave with? It's like, well, maybe these essential skills. So even if the content changes, the technology changes, they're still capable of thriving in the year 2030 or the year 2040 or the year 2020. You know, I, 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 um, some of the pushback from, I know administration is listen, man, we don't have time. Like we have so yeah. much content we have to deliver, but here's what I've learned in my classrooms over. And I've taught all kinds, I've taught, you know, sciences and English and I was mm -hmm. a music teacher for a long time and leadership and all kinds of stuff with kids. And what I have found is that is such an investment. It actually saves time because when you spend time talking to kids and teaching them how to shake hands in biology yeah. class, before we ever get to the biology and we're, and we're building our family, our classroom family with those essential skills rather mm -hmm. than soft, then everything is going to be delivered so much more effectively and efficiently. Right. And I know I'm slow, like the beginning of the school year. I know I'm behind at the end of August. Yeah. I know at the end of the first six weeks, I'm a little behind the other classes, but I promise you we are going to pass them up. And since I'm competitive, we're going to crush them in the end. Well, and so that's, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with you. Like we need to trust teachers that their pacing works, like that we are slow in the beginning, we're building a foundation. But then we also have to realize that when students are doing work that's engaging and really uses these essential skills, you know, research shows that they're getting the cognitive development as well. You know what I mean? Like just, we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You know, I, I, I sometimes talk about this stuff and people are like, well, yeah, I still have to teach them my content. I still have to teach them my subject matter. And I'm like, yeah, I agree. I want our students to know how to use semicolons. I want them to be able to solve complex problems. Of course, we should still teach the content. But when we make the learning authentic, when we give them real problems, when, they, when they're having to serve other people while they're learning the content, service learning, research shows and anecdote after anecdote shows that the students are still learning that subject matter as good, if not better, than when they were just learning it in the rote memorization traditional format. You know what I mean?
Yeah. And by the way, since this is what I, well, me, but this is what we all signed up for. Like, I know for a fact, I'm a more effective educator because now I have those deeper relationships in place. That's exactly right. Kids trust you. When you, when you say, Hey guys, we're going to do some hard work today. I need you to focus. Yeah. If you have a relationship and they love you and they know that you love them, you care about them. They're going to be much more inclined to say, okay, I'm going to dig in and do this because you asked me to. Hey, when, when you first started in the classroom, at what point, how, how far into your experience as an educator did you think that you were starting to figure some things out? Oh, geez. You, day one. No, just kidding. <laughs> I still don't have it all figured out. I mean, and, and the, I, I will say this. I think by year three is when I started to hit a little bit of a rhythm and feel a little bit more confident. Year one, I was like a chicken with its head cut off. Year two was a chicken with its head like slightly on. You know, I mean, I was, I was still operating. I was getting better. I was learning how to work with students, but it was still pretty difficult. And then by year three, I was starting to feel like, okay, I can command a classroom. I know I've, I've got some lessons that tanked that I know what I need to do to tweak them and make them better. I'm starting yeah. to learn to get better at working with parents and using them as an asset and a resource in the classroom. I, I'm just getting more confident. And so year three is when that ship started to turn. Year four is when it started picking up steam. And, and, and that's why I think it's such a shame that the average teacher leaves the classroom after year three, like, because the first three years are difficult, right? It's, really hard at this last event I did last week on Wednesday in Corpus Christi, Texas mm. at the teaching a rock star event. I had, um, I had a student there who, I mean, this is 30 years. I mean, this is a long, I guess, I don't even know, 28 years ago. I don't know. I can't keep track. Mm. I'm too old, but listen, I don't have my abacus in front of me, so I can't calculate. Well, and, okay. uh, and so, <laughs> and you know, it's like all, and she was as a first year teacher, I was there for my first few years. And I like, it's like, I wanted to apologize the whole time. Like, look, <laughs> you know, and we laughed about it. Like we agreed. I tried really hard. Yeah. Like no, <laughs> yeah. no, we tried hard in there and we worked hard. And, 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 but you know what, like she, the, the way she talked about it was so reassuring that like, I feel bad for my first few years. Cause I like, I yeah. wanted to be a great teacher. I just didn't have, I didn't have this, the skill. I didn't have yeah. the, the technique, the strategy, the experience, the wisdom. Um, I didn't have anything, but just passion and caffeine yeah. and, and, but you know what she, I mean, based on what she remembers is like, we all had a great time and we loved it. I know. I know. Well, and let's be honest, like teaching school and teaching college and teaching books are great. And, and I, and I think there's definitely merit and all that, but the best way to become a great teacher is to be, is by teaching, right. Yeah. By being in the classroom, being in the trenches, there's, there's really no other way to, to get good at it, to become proficient at it other than actually doing it and failing and learning and having mentors and, yeah. and, just, and just being there and doing it. Um, yeah, we, it, we we right here are the comment on the screen about our, our teachers needing uh, mentoring programs. I believe yeah. it, man. Like this whole thing about partnering up a first year teacher with somebody they're going to yes. meet for lunch <laughs> twice a month just isn't enough. No. And for me, it like really needs to be that same thing as an internship or a doctor, where it's like three or four years yeah. of you know of of getting together regularly. And I always said it needs to be more than one person. Yeah, have like have an academic you know content delivery every person have yeah. an emotional person that, that for self care, you know, have yeah. somebody who's helping them with their community and their family and their, you know, just every, like in every aspect, yep. we, it requires so much support and not just that one year, but like deep into three, four years. Oh, I mean, and, and but here's the truth, Hal, and you already know this. Most teachers don't get that. Yeah. You know, most teachers I talk to live in islands and, and even though they see 120 kids a day, they don't see any adults every day. They see adults once a week at a staff meeting where they're not allowed to talk. And it's usually an administrator in the front of the room talking and they just sit there quietly. And then when it's over, they go to the rooms and they're by themselves again. It's an isolating profession. And like you said, the very best results come from teachers that are collaborative. They're working with other people. You know, I had a woman named um, Sherry Steelman. I don't know if Sherry's on here, but uh, Sherry's like a 40 plus year teacher. And she's the greatest teacher I've ever met in my entire life. And from my student teaching days, even to now, Sherry still checks in. She still like digs into my career, still is sending me resources and ideas and lets me come and visit her class. And she's still a part of my teaching profession. And I think she always will be. 
as long as Sherry's still able and willing to do it, I'm always going to be open to that. And somebody like that has a huge impact on me. And it's like, I shudder to think what would happen if I didn't have somebody that was actively going after me and, and investing me in the way that I invest in students. Yeah. You know, it's interesting to hear you talk about um, the island and, you know, the administrator at the front of the room at the faculty meeting in the library on Tuesday afternoon. Yeah. You know, I, <laughs> I was visiting a school this maybe three or four weeks ago, and I visited a lot of schools that week. So no one's going to know which one it is, but I was leaving and the, <laughs> um, and the, and the, Gotta be the careful. But no, I'm good. And um, and I would tell them anyway. I think I probably did. And there is their director. They have a, like a, a um, instructional coach delivery person there at the front of the room. And there's all the teachers in the little chairs in the library. And she's yelling. She's talking to them. I want to see more engagement. I want to see more collaboration. Uh -huh. And I'm thinking, you, well, how about like, how about you? Like, why don't we, why don't we model, model what you're looking at? Here. That's right. Come on. <laughs> and, I, and all these teachers are staring back at them, taking notes off the PowerPoint. I think you've got to be kidding me. But man, let me tell you this is one of the most impressive things I love every time it, it, it comes up every year my Facebook is uh, one of my favorite uh, brand new teachers is Cassidy Carroll and she was on this show and one of the most amazing things within the first few weeks of her beginning her teaching career there's a picture of her door inviting people to come into her class and watch her I teach and it. provide feedback Brilliant. and she's like a two-month teacher and I'm thinking yeah. I had my door locked and I had all kinds of construction paper all over my window That's so right. no one knew what we were doing because I was too embarrassed man I don't want anybody yeah. to give me feedback I know I'm terrible well, so like I see over in the comments, Jess Breitfeller. Uh, I don't know if I said your name right, Jess, but Jess is uh, about to start student teaching next semester and she says she's nervous. And it's like, I would tell any young teacher, listen, if the school, and I don't, I can't speak for anybody else's school, but if the school doesn't have a system set up to give you a mentor, to give you people who can give you honest feedback and honest encouragement and a support system, if it doesn't do that, then I would encourage you, I would implore you to go seek it out, right? Like go find people who can, who can pour into you and, and offer you advice and wisdom. Don't wait for it, but actually go and find it. It's essential. And if yeah. you do that, you're going to love being a teacher that much more. Yeah. And that's one of the things I would love about help a teacher in this Facebook page mm -hmm. is all of the support. Right. And I know it, it's delivered in oftentimes in memes and funny things and cute and supportive things. But you know what? This is also a place I think where teachers can come and collaborate and, and ask and ask for help. Yep. You know, that's right. And, and that's what we got to do. I, and and I, I agree. I, I love this page because it's really about like, hey, you know what? I need help. Everybody needs help in every career and profession, but especially teachers. This is hard work, right? This is difficult, challenging, complex, skilled labor. And, uh, and, and we need help with it. And so I love that this is a space where people can ask for it and it's provided. Yeah. You know what? When I, when I first heard about Help a Teacher, I got to tell you, this is um, funny. And um, somebody came up to me at a school and they're telling, they're explaining what this thing was. I'm like, wait a minute. So you're going to post your stuff, uh, you, some supplies and whatever, whatever you need for your class. And then somebody's going to buy it. No, that's okay. Thanks for, and I just thought, I didn't think it was on. <laughs> that, I, didn't, I, I didn't think they were lying. I just thought they were confused. Yeah. And then I said, well, they're confused. That's okay. And then, <laughs> um, you know, I'm confused about a lot of things in my life. I'm not, yeah. you know, nothing gets them. And then uh, maybe two months later, somebody else comes up to me and tells me the same thing. So I finally have to check this out. And I come across this thing and this is like hundreds of thousands of people ago and followers ago. Yeah. And it really was this amazing place where, you know, so many teachers, I don't know about you, man, but I would probably go through, I'd probably spend about a thousand dollars a year in my classroom and stuff yeah. and supplies and where people would post that, that list and somebody in the world, somewhere in the world yeah. would fund it and it would get delivered. I and, and what I love about it is it's taking these teachers from the Island that you spoke about and at least letting them know yeah. that there are people out there that love them and support them and will help. Yep, absolutely. Everybody's had a teacher, man. Everybody, that's absolutely. the thing. When I ask everybody, every it's a hundred percent. Everybody can name their teacher. Everybody has one. That's right. And, and because and of that, they want to invest in teachers. That's right. And and people want to help. And and I think this whole idea that everybody's against teachers is really a small minority. I think we all know. Everybody knows that teachers are powerful. That that they have such an influence and an impact on people, and and they want to be a part of it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I love it as well. Yeah. How, how many years did you spend in the classroom? Uh, we're on year 10. So, yeah, yeah we're yeah, not, not to 25 yet, but working yeah. our way there. And then at your, now you're, you're at the university now. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I get to teach um, 
future teachers at Grand Valley. So helping them figure out what they need to do to get there. And then I also teach a gen ed class for uh, students who are not going to be teachers, but it's really about what does the impact, what impact does education and schooling have on you? Um, really getting them to consider how do I want to invest in and pour into teachers in the school system as lawyers or as business people or engineers, whatever it is, how can I connect back into it? So that, that's a fun class. It's fun to help people who don't know the education world to help understand it a little bit. For you, as you're sending our next generation of uh, educators who are going to stand before our leaders of tomorrow who are sitting in our classrooms today, what are the, like, I, I know it's, it's partnering up with amazing educators and, yeah. and finding a mentor. I know that's critical. Is, is, is there something else that you're passionate about that you, when you, when you sent, when you send them out the door and you know, they're going to go student teach and going to be in front of the class, like what is important for you to have sunk into their head, sunk into their heart? Yeah, I, I think it's just about asking, what do my students need? You know, when each generation, each, each, each decade needs something different, whether it's what, what does the career world, what do they need in order to succeed in the career world? What do they need to do to succeed in this political climate? What, are the, what, like, what do they need and, and what can I do to make my class look like that? You know, if, if we are just teaching the way that my grandfather was taught and my father was taught and I was taught, those were all taught very similar ways then we're not actually serving our students' needs. Um, but, it, but if we're creating learning experiences that are dynamic and engaging and authentic, and, and they meet the needs of students who live in poverty or are disenfranchised or, or, or want to get into a career that doesn't necessarily focus on all the core subjects, but they still need that training while they're in school, whatever it is, what do our students need? How can I be the teacher that helps meet those needs? You know, that's mm -hmm. why my second book is all about collaboration. Like we live in a society that deeply know, needs to know how to collaborate. I mean, just look at Washington DC right now. There's just, there, it doesn't seem like anybody knows how to work together. Go on social media and look at how many people don't know how to listen to each other and, and, and work together. Look at the number one reason that people are fired from their jobs. The number one soft skill, it's this collaboration. People don't know how to do it. And so I'm wondering like, I wonder if that's because we don't teach it. We just expect people to know how to work on teams and work together and listen to each other and have conversations. We just expect it to happen. Um, and then we go to school, which is very individual minded, individual seating, individual achievement, individual grades. Um, do people just not know how to do it? And so like when I say like we need to like meet students needs, we need to teach them how to collaborate. We need to teach them how to work in groups successfully. We, you know, we, we've got to be able to teach um, what society actually needs from our kids. You know, it, it is a fascinating time and, and what's interesting to see, and I, I too believe it, you know, because we do come, we, the, there's still this model for education that exists where we're going to sit in rows and columns, alphabetical order. You do the work. Don't, don't do your own thing, man. Just do what I tell you to do. Don't That's make right. mistakes. Just follow this directions. And then, you know, without this kind of individual thinking or collaboration, but what, it, what is a deep need for every human being is to find their team, is to find a family, right. find their tribe, to feel connected to another group of people yep. so that's going to happen but what happens now is what they do is they link up with people that are just like them so that's still not collaboration they're just uh -huh. on the same team that yeah. they think they say they have the same identical ideological thoughts yep. well that, that's not collaboration that's just agreeing with we with each other and yelling at everybody else and that's just kind of what we see like either right right like i mean i i've every teaching staff i've ever been in has people of different political beliefs, religious beliefs, non-religious beliefs. Like it's made up of all these people and yet we're still expected to work together and collaborate together and, and pr produce results and have a successful school. It doesn't matter if we don't agree with each other, we still have to work together. And so when school, it's we say, oh no, you sit alphabetically or, oh yeah, I'll let you choose to be in groups with your friends. I, you just do it, you just work with whoever you want or everybody make their own slide and put it together in the, the power PowerPoint in the end, you know what I mean? Like that's not real collaboration. And so therefore people don't know how to do it. Um, yeah. And so the world dictates it, the world needs it. And so we've got to teach it. Even though I also will say loud and clear that I also realize that group work is difficult, right? <laughs> group work's hard. And so everybody's yeah. like, yeah, that sounds great. But do you know how hard it is to get four seven-year-olds to work together? I right. recognize that. Um, yeah. But I still feel like we've got to learn how to do it and do it well. And group is hard. Group group work is hard for me, you know, and, and, you know, I think it's probably one of the reasons I do what I, you know, I, I never really, anytime they told me there's a team meeting, oh my God, 
I know. Just let me do my own thing, man. You know? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I'm and yet, I bet some of the best learning experiences that I've ever had were designed with other teachers. It's yeah. been in front of a whiteboard and we all throw our ideas down and we critique and we give feedback. That's where the best stuff's ever came from is when I do it with other people. Um, it's true. And, you know, and that's another skill is just how, learning how not to um, uh, 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 douse the flame of inspiration and creativity right. where you get in that moment and you do that. Yes. And thing, not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that yeah, whole, but yeah. Ugh, yeah. But that's never going to work, but yes. And, and we build on it and we go deeper and deeper and get more creative in the depth and the breadth of that creativity. Yeah. And we see how weird and wild and wacky the ideas can get and yeah. just keep going and going and going. And in those moments, you're right, man. That's when like those real magical moments of breakthroughs happen. Well, it was cool. I, I, when I was writing my book, I interviewed an engineer at Google and she FaceTimed and took me all through the Google campus. And she showed me the millions of dollars in collaborative furniture all over the place. <laughs> she says that Google gives her team a, a bunch of math engineers um, money every single month to go on a getaway. So they go to the bar, they go to a, a, a restaurant, they go out to the beach. Google pays for that. They pay for all of their meals. So they sit together. They invest millions of dollars in collaboration. And I asked this engineer, I said, why does Google put so much money into collaboration? Is it just to make everybody happy? And she goes, well, no, yeah, it's, they want people to be happy, but the main reason they do it is that it's profitable. I said, what do you mean? She's like, Google is the second largest company in the world. They want to make money. And they found that when people collaborate well, when, we, when they combine minds and they work through ideas, they come up with bigger projects, better projects, more projects, and more money-making projects. Collaboration's profitable. And so, yeah, it's hard to teach, but once students have it, they actually learn better because of it, right? They actually solve bigger problems because of it. You know, I think it's also hard to teach because most teachers, including myself, I was never in a class. I, I never learned it. You know, I, it's hard to be it unless you see it. Like yeah. I need, I need someone, you know, to show it so they can grow it in me. You yeah. know, I can't, it's really difficult, you know, and that, that alone, when we talk to teachers about collaborative learning and project-based yeah. learning, they're thinking, man, that sounds amazing. But as soon as they get in a classroom, they go back to what they were doing because they know that they experienced that for 12, yeah. 13, 17, 20 years of their life. And the, that other new stuff is, is hard. Like you don't even know what it's supposed to look like. Well, and like, like I said earlier, a lot of teachers, and this isn't just me saying this, I talk to a lot of teachers all the time about collaboration. We're really good students. And so if you are a good student and you're made to do some BS collaborative group project, um, you're usually the one carrying all the weight, right? Like everybody else rides on your coattail and you're having to do all the work. And so like naturally the good students learn to hate collaboration because they're doing all the work and everybody else yeah. gets credit for it. And so a lot of teachers become teachers and they're like, yeah, I hate group work. I was always the one doing all the work. I was always like the hog. I had to hog it all while everybody else was a log and just laid there the whole time. Um, and so I, I think it puts a bad taste in your mouth, just like you said. Yeah, man. So, so right now, like when, when you're traveling around, you're working with schools and hanging out with teachers, yep. what are you hearing? And like, what do you, what do you, what are you excited about? What are you yeah. seeing out there that really fires you up? Let me test. Ah, oh, that's a that's an easy one to answer. So, you know, I got to speak at forty different places last year, mm -hmm. and uh, every single time I'd come home and tell my wife that, uh, God, I love teachers. Like, and I, and I really do mean that. Like, yeah, whether I was in Tennessee or California, or I was down in Bogota, Colombia. The Net I mean, just all over the place. And every time I'd meet teachers, I would come back and be like, Gosh, these are some selfless and passionate people. Um, and and it just gave me a lot of hope for our society and country because the people who are interacting with every single one of our students, um, they're, they're just good people. They're, they're yeah. hard workers. They're impassioned people. Um, and it just, it, I don't know. I, that, that's what I'm excited about is that I, I think education is in very good hands and we just need to shift the system a bit. Yeah. You know what I do? Like at the end of my, at the end of my events, when I'm sitting there and we just spent the day together and we kind of developed this relationship, we, we, you know, cause like, I'm, you know, I'm sharing some heartfelt stuff mm -hmm. and they share their stuff and you get to know people on a deep emotional level. And I'm always just standing there looking in the eyes of educators and on the edge of the stage, I'm there and I'm, it's just like, thank God that these kids have you. That's right. Ah, oh, it's good stuff. That's right. You know, mm -hmm. like, I, like I feel mm -hmm. so good about, 
about our kids simply because they have these people that have accepted that honor and privilege to stand them before them every day and accept that responsibility of being the most influential adult in their life. I mean, it's just, right. I love it, man. Yeah, I know it's it's inspiring. I yeah, I know I go places with the purpose of hoping to inspire people, but I and I'm not saying this to be cliche. I leave feeling inspired. Like yeah, it's I true. Leave feeling like you know what? Like I said, we're in good hands. Um, and so I, I think we just got to keep pushing it. I think we got to be aware of that. I think we got to be loud about it. You know, that that's one of the big reasons I have a Facebook page and videos and, and books and all this stuff is to really just keep increasing this awareness that we've got a tribe of teachers out there. What is it, like 2 million of them that uh, are doing really, really great work in our world. And you know, when there's a this event I'm coming up, uh, I think it's in Montana, I'll speak at. And what the whole goal is helping schools do a better job of sharing their stories. Cause yeah. here's what, you know what? If I have to call out teachers and tell them they're doing something bad at or schools, here, let me hear, let me tell you what you're doing bad at. And it's this, we're just not letting people know about the miracles that are happening in your classroom every day. Like, I don't yeah. think we, we're really affect. And here's why. You know why, man? It's because we're numb to it. Like yeah. we see this stuff every single day. Like yep. we see these magical mountaintop moments every single day and we get numb to it. And we don't realize like that, that kid's life just got changed, right? That kid's yeah. on a new trajectory right yeah. there. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to do a better job of recognizing it and sharing it with, with the world. Yeah. I'm with you. I agree. Yeah. Th that was one of those, um, you know, you'll see these inspiring posts about, um, you know, a, there's a there'll be a picture of a teacher uh, hugging a kid in the hallway and the kid's crying. And it'll get shared like a zillion times. And I think it should. But I wish I wish people also knew that was one of 10,000 pictures that were taken today of that yeah. same exact experience. And, and you know why it gets shared so much is because everybody had that experience. That's right. You know, I mean, they all resonate with it. It's nothing new to them. And they're like, hey, there's me being hugged right there. And so I'm going to share this. That's why I'm, the very first video I ever had go nuts. And this one was the one that got the millions and kind of started all this fun stuff for me. It was called teaching is tiring and then in parentheses, but worth it. And, and it was the first minute and a half of the video is just all the reasons that teaching's tiring. And believe me, I got thousands of comments of people who didn't finish the video who were like, Oh, we get it. Teaching's hard. Right. Yeah, so, so is my job's hard, blah, blah, blah. But then the last 30 seconds is, yeah, but here's all the reasons why it's worth it. You know what I mean? Like chaperoning dances and, and having kids who come to school hungry and dealing with parents and, and reading the news about teachers. Yeah, all this stuff is tiring. But when you have a kid burst through the door with a college acceptance letter or a kid reading for the very first time or a kid, um, you, know, you know, finally knowing what they want to do with their life what, or a kid coming to you years later to thank you, all of those reasons make it worth it. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that we should be happy with getting paid underpaid as master's degree holding professionals. This doesn't mean we should be okay with unfair work practices, but it does mean that we realize that we hit these mountaintops that a lot of other careers don't get to hit at the same amount that we do, right? Yeah. Like teachers get to experience these, these joyous moments all the time if we're looking for them. And so, like you said, we got to share that. It, it resonates with people. We just got to keep putting it out there. Hey man, you want to give away some money? Come on, let's do it. <laughs> it 300 large. We uh, we got three of them at 100 large each. Come on. Look at some you, 100 large. East Coast, baby. All right. All right. Hey, man, look at this. Uh, she's always commenting. I love this one. Um, Najet Jones, a $100 gift card, Miss Jones. And it could be Amazon. It could be Target. That's 100 large for you and uh do with whatever you want with your class man get them some amazing stuff april hoover taylor that's a hundred dollar gift card amazon or target Ooh. and john harper j-o-n no h for john john harper and a hundred dollars as well listen man thank you so much to the craig newmark philanthropies for making all that a reality yeah. And um, that he that like that's a perfect example. I mean, they could be sending um, funding anywhere, but there's somebody on the staff there. You know, uh, Craig had a, had a teachers he remembers it made a difference in his life, and and you know now he's giving back. Love it. Love it. Awesome. Well, congrats everybody on the hundred bucks. That's sweet. 
Yeah, man. Hey, tell me what you got coming up. Do you have any events for people to come catch you or book you, hire you? Tell me what's up, man. Yeah, I mean, I, I've got all my events listed. You can go to trevormuir.com. Um, and we can drop a link in here, but go check it out. It'll tell you where I am. I'm all over Texas this summer, actually. So we got to hook up, pal. But I'll be in Texas four different times at different public events that you can come to. I'll be in Charleston, South Carolina. I'll be in L.A., all over the place. Um, but uh, we're also starting a book study on my first book, The Epic Classroom, here on the Help a Teacher page. And that does start on March 3rd. I so, was right. I knew it. Come March on, baby. 3rd. Yeah. So I think the deadline to sign up for that is March 2nd. Um, and you can go grab a copy of it and I'm going to be there too. I'm bopping in every now and then uh, to get into it with everybody. But yeah, it's just really a book about how do we make the learning experience memorable for kids? How do we make it engaging and transformative um, and really use, looking at what are some different specific concrete things we can do to make learning even more memorable than it already is. So that'll start on March 3rd. And my new book is The Collaborative Classroom. And that's really kind of zooming in and figuring out how do we not just teach how to do group work, but how do we do it and not have to rip our hair out and actually love it as teachers? It's awesome. Hey, man, I appreciate you so much taking the time. I know you got your fam in the whole bit and taking a few moments to join us. It, it, it uh, means a lot to me and help a teacher and everyone that um, is on here tonight. Yeah, it was my pleasure. And it was my pleasure to read all these comments. I'm going to go back through them after this um, and read what everybody's been saying. But uh, yeah, it's been fun. Hal. Thanks for having me on. All right, man. Have an amazing uh, week coming up. Yep, you too. Have a good one. Bye, everybody.